Good afternoon, and welcome to today's IABC Region Members Only Webinar, Measurement Basics for Communications Professionals. This session is the fifth and final in a series that will be presented by Jim Schaefer, an internationally recognized business advisor and leadership coach, a member of the IABC Heritage Region, and an esteemed IABC Fellow. Jim will be joined by Bob Kula, Vice President of Corporate Communications at Kiewit Corporation, a Fortune 500 company based in Omaha, Nebraska. My name is Mary Bogan and I'm past chair of the IABC Heritage Region. Amy Miller, our past past region chair and current region finance chair is our tech guru today. Before Jim and Bob begin, Amy will review a few quick points to help you gain the most from this webinar. Thank you, Mary. Everyone, if you would like to ask a question anytime during the webinar, please use the chat button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Just mouse down to the bottom of your screen and your toolbar will appear and you'll see the chat button. Jim will pause at various times to address the questions that have come in through the chat tool. <laughs> We may also save some questions for the end. Today's webinar is being recorded. As a registered attendee, you will receive the following by this Monday. A link to the recording, a link to Jim's slide deck for reference, and a link to our survey. And please do continue to send us your feedback. It's very important. Helps us plan for our next events. Okay, and back to Mary. Thanks, Amy. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Jim Schaefer is an internationally recognized business advisor, leadership coach, author, speaker, and leader of the Jim Schaefer Group, a team of seasoned advisors devoted to improving strategy execution through strong leaders and engaged people. He's also a heck of a nice guy. His book, the Leadership Solution immediately became a popular treatise on leadership, change management, and creating high-performance organizations. A regular contributor to many business publications and frequently quoted in business journals, Jim has taught at multiple graduate schools of business. He speaks regularly at leadership groups and professional associations, including IABC's World Conference, and at our upcoming Heritage Region Conference in November in Richmond, Virginia. Bob Kula is responsible for Kiewit's <laughs> public affairs, internal communications, and marketing services functions, working closely with more than 22,000 employees to manage the company's corporate reputation globally. He is responsible for protecting and building Kiewit's brand and delivering on core operational and financial objectives. This includes maximizing the company's internal and external communication processes, including media and public relations, crisis and issue management, government and community affairs, online and social media management, and employee communication. Previously, Bob served as Senior Director of Corporate Communication at ConAgra Foods and in communication, public affairs, and public relations leadership roles at Selectron Corporation and Weber Shandwick, one of the world's largest PR agencies. And with that, I'll turn the program over to Jim and Bob. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Amy. Uh, thank you for all the work you've done in the last uh, few months to go through these different um, webinars with um, uh, the good people from uh, IABC Heritage. Um, this all got started um, sort of way back when a number of uh, organizations started talking to me about the importance of building competencies among communication people uh, that would help them um, serve as uh, strategic advisors and more of a counseling role. And they said some of the, the competencies that we really need are uh, area, areas such as strategic advisor skills and also change management, business and financial acumen, leadership development, and measurement. Uh, each one of these has been focused on those subjects, and we've gotten a lot of very, very positive uh, responses about that. Um, today we're going to talk about measurement, and I am absolutely delighted to have Bob Kula with us today 
as you heard, he was with ConAgra Foods, where I first met him. First time I ever spoke with him, I was up in uh, BC in Canada, about ready to go on for the IABC World Conference, and Bob called me and wanted to talk about a project uh, in Marshall, Missouri. We went on and on and on. I kept looking at my watch and I kept saying, Bob, I really do need to get down to, the, <laughs> down to talk to these people. Well, that started a, a good relationship that we've had over the years where we worked at Conagher Foods and we've done a little bit of work there at Keywood as well. So I'm delighted to have a, a, a former client and somebody who can testify that uh, a lot of this uh, content that we're going to talk about today actually really works. So let's uh, let's start from a little bit of a historical perspective. Uh, way back there, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago, uh, guys like Roger Dupree, who's written more books on internal communication than anybody else, it's got to be at least nine or ten books, he was talking about the need to move from being reporters, that is, having journalism degrees and uh, spending time communicating with uh, employees of the organization about news and information that would be useful to them. Um, what happened was then leaders started um, turning to their communication people and say, hey, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, and they started assuming the role of an order taker. Uh, many people still sit in those kinds of roles, and I think one of the things that I hear uh, all the time, and I'm sure I'm going to hear it at the IABC Heritage Conference in Richmond in November, is that how do I become a strategic advisor? How do I counsel my leaders instead of just go do the work um, every day? And so that is what started a lot of that and started a lot of the kind of conversations that we've been having. One of the things that's going to be very, very important for internal communication functions, and that is you're going to need to have to shift from a cost center where they are, in effect, in many cases, a drain on the business. That is, they spend a dollar, but a dollar doesn't come back, or you've just drained some value from the business. And instead, be focusing much more on value creation. And it is doable, as Bob will tell you in a little bit, and he'll show you what he has done to create value by getting gains that are greater than the cost of getting those gains. More and more people, and we're going to talk about some of those people today, are showing that it's doable. So the doable issue is not on the table anymore. What I think needs to happen is we need to learn how to do it, what's the best way to do it, and what's the way that we can uh, become a value a creator for our organizations and add more value and, quite frankly, make some more money, too. So the shift has to go from information distribution business to a solutions business, solving problems that the business has, solving problems like quality problems, like uh, damage problems that Bob can talk about, is probably going to talk about as it relates to a huge distribution center that we did work that needed to reduce damage by about $2 million, while at the same time improving productivity. So we need to get away from just getting information out because that is a cost that has no return, but to get information out and managed well so that we improve the performance of the business, whether it's quality service, cost, speed, productivity, on-time delivery, or whatever it might be. So the critical thing that communication practitioners are now asking for is give me the content, give me the skills and knowledge I need to be able to become a value creator. And I'll tell you what, I hear from the business leaders who are talking about their communication people, and we're going to show you a survey here in just a couple of minutes, it was conducted by Populo, um, that says very much the same thing as coming from communication people. Our communication people work on the outskirts of town, I was told by the head of an organization, the CEO of an organization, I said, what does that mean? He said, they don't get into center city. They don't get into the business of the business. They're sort of out there on the outskirts of our business and they're doing stuff, but it isn't the kind of stuff that really helps us uh, execute our business strategy or be more competitive uh, in, the market, in the marketplace. So you've got that kind of, of thinking. Uh, here's, here's one from somebody who is an operations manager. And he said, uh, this is in, uh, down in uh, Tampa, I told my communication team that we needed to improve warehouse security. Employees were stealing things off the shelves. Our communication team suggested that we send a brochure to employees about the problem. I told them that people aren't stealing because we don't have a brochure. 
I want help identifying and elim eliminating the root cause of the problem. I want the communication people to think and act like business people, not just get something out. Here's another one from, um, this is a senior vice president of marketing at a pharmaceutical. Um, he, I was in the process of doing a communication assessment for this very large pharmaceutical, very well-known pharmaceutical, and I was looking at the entire communication system inside the organization, including the functions. And then I was uh, interviewing a number of the leadership people and talking to and interviewing the communication people to put together a whole new communication process in their company. And the marketing guy said, our communication people are worried about the wrong things. I tell them about a business problem I'm having and they trot out the same activities. They worry about click-throughs, opens, mentions, share of voice, awareness, and retweets. He said, I'm worried about sales and gross margin. Where can I find communication people who can help us improve our business? And so we're, we're hearing much more of that sort of thing. Um, here's one um, from a consumer packaged goods company. The first thing our communication people do is decide what tactic they'll deploy way before they think about the root cause. I want them to start with the result they need to create, then decide what tactic to deploy. Well, we're hearing a lot about that from other people, senior leaders, and we're hearing it from communication professionals. This is a Populo study. Now, Populo is based in Cork, Ireland, and is an exceptional communication firm. Um, and, and we did a survey with them about uh, a year ago of 1,100 communication professionals. And you can see the kinds of things that they're talking about. We're not perceived as adding value, got the wrong priorities, and competency gaps. And, and Bob and I were talking just the other day about just these things. Bob, you want to share with the folks what you have experienced as it relates to this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, Jim and, and IBC, I appreciate the opportunity to, to jump on here. You know, in, in the spirit of, of full transparency, uh, I've known Jim now for about 12 years uh, and worked with him a number of times and, and consider him a, a friend, mentor in, in the business. But um, I was extremely cynical about this. Uh, as Jim was uh, talking about that first phone call where he was waiting to get uh, to his uh, presentation or speech, I mean, I was peppering with maybe 782 questions and really finding ways to say this isn't going to work for me or work for, for Conagra Foods when I was at that company at the time. So um, just, you know, I, I can appreciate when sometimes people hear Jim talk or these presentations about what, what he's going to be talking about more is, you know, oh, really, uh, this doesn't apply to me, doesn't work. And let me just say that of those quotes that Jim included about other business leaders, I don't know if you guys have heard those or not, but I will tell you over the course of my career, particularly when I was at Conagra Foods at the time, I, I was hearing a lot of that. Uh, and it, it really bothered me uh, in the sense of saying, you know, I, I didn't want to be a peripheral player. I didn't want our communication organization to be seen as just the doers, the, you know, execute. Yeah, they'll, they'll do some nice stuff with a collateral piece or a, a really cool video. But at the end of the day, that's not where the money is made. And that's not where the value really is driven. And so um, for me, what I wanted to just talk about here was I, I, I shared, this would have been me probably 10 or 15 years ago about my concerns and, and, and issues and things like that. And the one thing I will tell you is that if you're looking for a place to start, and Jim will get into this a little bit more, I think this really comes down to is, you know, how interested are you in really making a change? Changing how you operate, how you, the priorities you have, the workload that you do, uh, where you're moving in your career, because that, I was really at that moment back in 2006 of, of really trying to figure out what, what was next and, and what did I want to do? Do I want to keep doing the same thing I'd already been doing for 10 or 12 years? Or did I want to do um, something a bit different? And where it all started for me was essentially listening to Jim talk about this, reading his book, and then starting to have discussions with leaders in my business to say, all right, you're saying that we're not getting it. Well, how do we get it? And more importantly, if I help you improve your safety numbers, improve your quality numbers, your turnover numbers, your productivity numbers, is that something that would work for you? Because I've got an approach or a philosophy, a structure, whatever you want to call it, that Jim will talk a little bit more about that I think can help improve those numbers. And the minute those conversations started to happen and I started talking like a business person first, not a communicator first, it, things started to change almost immediately. Now, stars had to be a little bit in alignment. I had a very supportive boss at the time back in 06 when we started to look at this. But 
there were a number of operations leaders and business leaders that were saying, you know what, I'm tired of having metrics that we can't sort of get them over the hump or improve them the way we want to improve them. And so, Jim, I know you're going to talk a little bit more about how you get at that. So maybe I'll, I'll let you tee up the next slide here. Okay, sounds good. Let's pause for just a minute and see if there are any questions in the chat box or if anybody has a question you'd like to put in the chat box. We're going to take a, a, a little bit of time here and let you um, react to what we've said so far. Um, we've got one question for Bob. Um, Bob, who did you have to talk with in your organization to find out what problems communications could help people solve? So, um, well, a few people. I mean, first of all, everything started with, because uh, at that time I was a senior director of employee communications at Conagra. Uh, my boss was one of the first people I talked to about this, just from the standpoint of really seeing if this was something we could we could do and, and change. And she was actually a, a huge supporter of this. In fact, you could argue that she was helping drive me forward uh, because she saw the opportunity. And then for me, I actually had had a lot of um, strong relationships with our supply chain organization. So our head of operations, our head of supply chain, logistics, um, all those folks, uh, the typical folks you'd find there. And I had enough of a relationship and I would argue a credibility for doing the more tactical communication stuff. I mean, giving them the things that quote unquote they, they wanted. Um, and those are the folks that I talked to. And it was really making, at that point I really understood how they, how they talked, the, the, you know, what metrics mattered to them, what were the things that mattered. And I started talking to them and asking them questions about, again, the metrics that I knew, um, you know, if I could somehow prove or at least give them, allow them to give me an opportunity to go chase after these metrics to improve them, um, I knew I would get their attention. One of the things that, one of the things that uh, Bob's boss at that time, Teresa is her name, uh, did a little bit later was as she started uh, moving the entire communication business in, inside Conagra Foods to this kind of a, a role, uh, she created with the team a value proposition that says what kind of work we're going to do. And she said, we're either going to make money or save money. If it doesn't make or save money, we won't do it. So she was really stepping out there with the kind of uh, thinking that I think is necessary when you're trying to make, make this kind of move. Yeah. I wanted to mention one more thing. <laughs> uh, for, for those who joined maybe a few seconds into the webinar, uh, we do have a chat button that you can use. If you mouse down on your screen, um, a little ribbon will appear on the bottom. Uh, the chat button should be, I believe, the third one from the right. Um, click that. You, you can um, share your comments or questions with the panelists or with the panelists and all attendees. We will be pausing periodically to answer questions, and we appreciate your, your input and your, uh, your curiosity. So please Great. do. Thanks. All right. Now, before we continue, I've got one more follow-up question for okay. Bob. Bob, okay. how did you even identify and then form a relationship with, with the business people in your organization, like the supply chain folks? That was, um, at least for me, kind of communication, the one-on-one stuff that we did. So um, when I came on board in Con at Conagra in 2004, uh, I, part of the job description, if you will, was to support, you know, at that time it was employee communications uh, holistically, but also there were some key players, including our uh, marketing organization and our operations organization, our supply chain. And so for me, it was, uh, they had already expressed an interest or an appetite for having some level of basic, you know, tactical, somewhat strategic communication support. So those relationships were started based on really my job description coming in. And then, you know, I'd like to believe that I established some, some pretty good relationships by, you know, doing what I did. And, and let me just say one other thing, too. Uh, Jim talked about the, the transformation that um, my more former boss, Teresa Paulson, drove in the communication function. Let me just stress two things. One is it did not happen overnight. It wasn't even close. I mean, it took a number of years. And I would argue that um, even though that organization has now changed and a number of us have moved on to other organizations um, just through career, um, our career development and past is that it, it took a long time to do that. And secondly, is that um, there was still a number of things that we had to deliver that were just expectations of the job. They may not have been high value. They may not have been we, very difficult to prove that they make money, but there was a philosophy among many that was, you gotta sometimes give them what they want so you can also give them what they need. 
And uh, that was a big part of it is that if we could continue to still, you know what, I still got to do that PowerPoint. I still need to develop that video. I still need to provide those talking points. Um, it allowed us because we had credibility there to do this other type of work and pilot this stuff and, and get uh, more out there into, you know, again, being more like business people as opposed to communications people. I think one of the things, I think one of the things around what Bob did too is that um, this was before um, Teresa came up with this approach and Bob uh, took advantage of an opportunity, as I said earlier in Marshall, Missouri, where there was some safety issues. And by being able to go in there uh, and we worked there for about five months and to come out with the kind of numbers that we came out with, number one was OSHA recordables were reduced by 50%. Um, the uh, absenteeism and turnover both were improved by 26 and 28 percent. They came along for the ride. We weren't really after absenteeism and turnover improvement, but when you start to improve safety, you're focusing on the people of the organization, and people want to be in a safe organization where um, where they're having a good time and they're working hard and they're making money. So as a, as a result of that, absenteeism and turnover went down. Bob was then able to take that success and apply it elsewhere in other Con Agri Foods operations. But sometimes it takes that first big success in order for people to say, hey, there is something to this. There are communication breakdowns that are causing people to underperform. And if we get rid of those breakdowns, we're going to perform better. So let's do more of it. One of the other things that Bob get, uh, got was a number of other senior people, like the head of supply chain and others, who started seeing this working. They wanted Bob. They wanted Bob to help them because why should so and so over here get all the goodies, you know, from from Bob when when um, I can get them too? And so that kind of creates pull for this kind of work. But getting that first success is a big help, right, Bob? Yeah, absolutely. And, and not to, to belabor this, but one final point, Jim, is that a lot of people, and it's a very fair point, maybe on this call or otherwise, I, I mean, I've presented on this topic because I believe passionately in it, and it's actually how I run my, it's, it's one of the foundational elements of how I run our corporate communication group here at Qit. Um, is it wasn't like I could, it, this was tough. It was tough. It was up. It was an uphill sled. It, 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 intuitively, I, it probably makes sense to everyone or hopefully does to everyone on this call, but you know, when I went into Marsh, Missouri, to that uh, manufacturing facility and spent, you know, two or three days there almost every week or, you know, every other week with Jim and, and doing this, and, and Jim was a part of this. Um, I also had my day job, if you will, and there were some things that were taken off my plate, but it was something that I believed in passionately enough out of the gate, um, both for what I thought was important for the company and my career, that, you know, there were nights in the hotels that Jim and I joked, the only thing in, in Marsh, Missouri is a Walmart and Applebee's and a few <laughs> dirt roads. <laughs> uh, you know, after a dinner with Applebee's at gym, I would go back to the hotel room and for two or three hours pound out some work uh, that was, you know, part of my, again, day job. So I want to be very clear that this is not easy work, but it is transformative and it is a game changer. And you'll see a little bit again, I don't want to tip the hand, Jim, because I know we got to get moving here on the slides. But there are a lot of people whose careers have changed as a result of doing this type of work. And I would actually argue that I, maybe I'm not that successful, but at the end of the day, how I think about my job and, and the level of um, enjoyment I get out of it, it has a lot to do with, with this type of work. Well, that moves us to measurement, which is what we're going to talk about today uh, a great deal. One of the things that you'll recall that we went after um, in Marshall, Missouri was uh, we, we were going after the um, safety issue, a big OSHA recordable issue, and that was why we went there. So we didn't go there for to do retreats, tweets, or page, look at page views and all that. If you look at over here on the left side, you see the communication measures that have been used historically. Over on the right side, you see the business measures that have been used historically. A lot of communication people get tied up over on the left side, the, the tweets, retweets, page views, readability, channel usage, and all that stuff. And I've seen a list of these numerous times in new, new, numerous different kinds of publications. The fact is, is that the, what's on the left side can be a roadmap and a tool to get you to the right side, because it could be the process that needs improved in order to make the result happen over on the right side. So it's not that we don't abide by the left side. We sometimes use that. But if we stay only on the left side, we're staying on the process side, not on the results side. If we stay over on the left side, 
we're going to step back and take a look at all those numbers and we're going to say not a single one of these tells us anything about the state of our business. Are we doing well or not? Channel usage doesn't tell. Readability doesn't tell us that. So it's really important going into this to understand that there are a lot of process things that need to happen. But if it's not improving customer measures, financial performance, internal processes like fulfillment time, on time uh, delivery and things like that, quality, safety, and those kinds of issues, then nobody's going to pay much attention to it. So it's really important going in that whatever you go after needs to be on the right side. Use the left side sometimes to help you get to back to the right side. Bob and I did a um, put together a field guide. Bob worked with Dave Jackson, who we're going to talk about here in a little bit, um, to create a field guide for managers in the organization. It was a spectacular guide that helped them understand how communication could, can improve performance of the business. And so what we put together um, was a, a whole field guide that had this sort of slide in it or this sort of page in it that explained what uh, the various different focus areas are in terms of a measure and then what the definition of the, that is. I've incorporated that in here. So you might want to take a look at it and say, okay, what does first pass quality mean? First pass quality means that the first time it goes through, you got it right and you don't have scrap at the end of the line. So what do you have with first call resolution, which happens to be used at contact centers? First call resolution and handle time come together because handle time is a, is a, a productivity issue. How quickly did I get the, the, the problem solved on the phone and did I get it in the first call? So those two are used for a call center. So these are the kinds of things you might want to take a look at and say, okay, where are opportunities in our organization, my organization, that can help us start to focus on the right things. Okay, what, how do we get into this? And what are the questions I might want to ask my boss if I'm sitting in your, your uh, seats today? And what we do, what I do with each one of the clients that I work with, unless they come to me and say that we've got an on-time delivery problem, we need to fix that problem, um, and somebody like uh, Bob or Dave Jackson or some other communication people might want to ask these kinds of questions. First of all, where are the best opportunities to improve performance by better managing communication? Notice I did not say where are the best opportunities to improve communication. I said where are the best opportunities to improve performance or results by better managing communication. I'm going to take you through a case study that we did with FedEx Express a few years ago. What we found was that the U.S. markets were saturated. That is, there wasn't going to be much business coming, coming out of the domestic markets in the United States. And so we're going to have to look externally where uh, Fred Smith, the chairman and CEO of uh, FedEx at that time, was saying, we're building these markets. We've got to st start capitalizing on them. So growing the U.S. business was the highest priority. And it was the, the primary measure that we were going to use was an increase in U.S. exports. So the second question we ask is, what's the size of the opportunity? In this case, it was calculated at $1 billion. What are the root causes of the underperformance? That, that doesn't say, when are we going to start a newsletter <laughs> to try to hit that $1 billion? What are the root causes of the underperformance? Number one, customers don't know about the export business. They don't even know we're in that business. Employees are confused about the business complexities. It, it was driving the employees in Los Angeles where we did a pilot on this. It was driving them nuts because they, they couldn't understand the business of the business. Uh, there was an incentive for couriers that discouraged them from selling the export business. What, what the, the, uh, the uh, incentive did is reward people for getting back to the station where they were headquartered quickly and safely. Well, that was a disincentive to try to sell exports at the loading dock. So that was something that was a root cause. We had to get rid of that. And then the sales and operations were not integrated poor communication between those two operations and not because they didn't like each other, they just didn't do it. And so we identified that it was going to cost us somewhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars to go after that one billion dollars. Is the ROI acceptable? Yes, absolutely. And so what we did is put together a strategy where we identified over here that the U.S. markets were saturated and here's the condition. So our goal is to increase U.S. exports. 
What were the barriers? I just talked about those. What is the strategy? We put together four work teams in Los Angeles to address the various communication issues, both external issues, customers didn't know about their business, internal issues, including the uh, reward system. So we communicated the, the customer and competitive environment to all of our employee groups that we were meeting with in Los Angeles. We modified the incentive plan to focus on speed, safety, and what's in it for them. And we improved the customer communication about the export business. In 90 days, we had generated 2,400 leads. The export volume was up 16% in Los Angeles and it was a 1,447% return. We calculated a 7% return. We thought that was going to be our target. That's what we were gonna be able to go get. It turned out that we, were, we understated the opportunity and we actually hit 16% and got a 1,447% return. Dave Bronzak, who at that time was the CEO of Express, said to his top uh, operations people, who wants to be next as a pilot like Los Angeles was? About 25 hands went up. You could manage because you could imagine because Terry Simpson, the communication person, um, and Scott Fiedler, the communication person, were getting a lot of credit, and people wanted to hire them to come to their locations. So we picked five locations. We couldn't do 20. We picked Seattle, Denver, Chicago, New York, and Miami, and we had a 6.1 million dollars in sales with almost a 1,700 percent return on the investment. We then took it to back to FedEx, and FedEx said. We have been convinced now that eliminating these communication breakdowns is causing this kind of lift in the, term, in, in, in the sense of uh, exports that we're going to take it globally. And that's exactly what they did. So they had six pilots that demonstrated it could be done in very different environments, uh, at least domestically. And so they took it, eventually they took it globally. But this is how doing one project like Bob did in Marshall, Missouri, uh, or doing one project in Los Angeles was able to, to catapult the communication people into a, a very, very different kind of role. Now, Jim, excuse yes. me. Yes, um, yes. We've got a couple of very specific questions. Okay. That I think that we should review before we move on. Okay. Um, with this FedEx example, who calculated the size of the opportunity? Who gave the cost to improve? And how were these figures arrived at? Well, we uh, one of the things that we did is we got together with the operations people and the um, finance people, um, and we met with the finance people. We met with the uh, top operations people in Memphis, that's where they're headquartered, and we went out to Los Angeles and we tested the idea out there. So we um, talked to the people who head that operation, that station is what it's referred to, and we talked to some people in marketing, in finance, um, Lean Six Sigma, communication, uh, human resources, and the operations people actually on the, the tarmac, the, the couriers as well as the people at the, at the uh, planes. So we got a huge amount of information from people and all of it was telling us the same thing as we were not capitalizing on, on uh, um, what we could, could capitalize on. And the, everybody admitted that the communication breakdowns were what was causing the problem. Okay, the next question, thank you. Mm -hmm. What was the cost of the incentive plan included in the 300,000 to 400,000 investment? No, the, the 300 to 400,000 did not include the incentive plan. The 300 to 400,000 was what it was gonna cost to manage this, this project from beginning to end. And it was gonna include um, going to Los Angeles, working in Los Angeles, building training programs, building uh, various different uh, publications that were created to help people on the ramp and help people in the distribution centers, help them understand better uh, what the opportunity was. We also had, um, we, we taught them, we didn't, we built training efforts uh, for the people in Los Angeles to teach people um, about the opportunity and, and what they could do about it. It did not include the, the incentive program. The, the incentive program was actually reduced um, and uh, modified so that it was, it was called finders keepers. And what it really said was, is that if I'm able to find a um, business, sales business, I get a piece of the action. So it basically wasn't an, another investment. It was a gain sharing kind of a plan in the sense that as we, we get more money back, I get just a little bit of a piece of it. Enough that was very, um, very attractive to the people who were 
um, able to generate that kind of, those kinds of leads. Okay. Now, how was the incentive program funded? Well, it was, it was, it was funded just uh, as any kind of an incentive program is funded out of human, re human resources funds it or, or creates the design for the, the funding plan, but it was funded out of the increase in sales. And so let's say I've never gotten any business from ABC company and I'm going to go in, I'm going to try to sell it and I get a hundred thousand dollars of sales out of it. I get a piece of that. So it was not an expense coming from the company. It was actually a gain coming from the, from the customer. Okay. And the last question I have goes back to um, the slide entitled measure what matters. Right. Um, it says, how do you tie the net promoter score or NPS and other business outcomes directly to internal communications when there are so many other factors that go into business results? Well, there's no question that there are other factors that go into it. Um, there's no question about that. Um, but the, um, the kinds of targets that you're going after, what you're doing is you're looking for places where the communication breakdowns are causing the underperformance. And so if in the case of net promoter scores, you don't have uh, people recommending you uh, for the business because you're, you have poor service or you have poor quality or whatever it is, when we can identify the fact that the reason for those breakdowns are re reason why we're not getting good quality or getting referrals or recommendations from customers, that there are oftentimes communication breakdowns that are contributing to that. It doesn't always happen that way, but Oftentimes it does. It, Jim, if I could interject there too, just as a, at a really high level here on this, as the communications guy here, the, um, the question that's being asked, I don't know if this was the exact intent behind it, but, but I had the same concerns and issues, and Jim can attest to this, especially when he talks about the Marshall, Missouri um, situation or story, was, well, yes, if we're trying to reduce the total incident rate or the OSHA recordable incident rate for safety as our, one of our primary metrics, I know full well that despite all the work that Jim and I are doing, there's also work that's being done by the plant manager, by the superintendents or, or the foreman and uh, even the, the employees who are working on the line and all this other stuff that were being done, I'll call it in tandem with, uh, but not necessarily being driven by us. And I got really wound around the axles about that to say, well, you know, how do I take any credit for, and not me personally, but communications take credit for a, you know, 22% reduction this month or whatever else it is. And, and to Jim's credit and, and just me thinking through it, it's like, that doesn't really matter. I know that ours is a part of the solution and it's very, you know, and it's now we've moved away from loose correlation or coincidental type of stuff to direct causation of knowing that we're helping drive the answer. And whether we were 20% of that solution or 100% of that solution, you know, the rising tide kind of floats all boats. And so it wasn't an issue as much. Um, following that. So like the net promoter score is a great example of, yes, there's other factors involved, but a lot of what we were doing were at least a part of, if not a big part of helping, you know, drive that improvement. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, Bob. And I think uh, just to capitalize on that just a little bit ago, that a uh, little bit is that we are not necessarily the fixers. We're helping the organization fix itself. Um, because a lot of what we, we do in all these different projects that we're doing is we're capitalizing on the people at, in Los Angeles who work for FedEx. There was only five of us that came in, quote, from, from Memphis. I wasn't coming in from Memphis, but you know what I mean. There was only four or five of us, two, two or three communication person and an HR person occasionally was there. Um, and I was there almost all the time with the communication people. So we weren't, we weren't fixing the business. We, were, we had a, a team of 15 people at the outset who were helping us um, identify. In fact, they pro they, I led the, or facilitated the process of a process map around the room of, in, a, in a conference room in order to identify where the opportunities are to improve the export sales. And the people in the room were the people who actually identified where the problems were and also then identified what the solutions were to, uh, to increase the export sales. So in many cases, we're the facilitators, we're the advisors, but we're not necessarily the people who actually do the work. And that probably applies to a lot of, a lot of people who are listening to this is you, you, you don't always try to be the person who fixes it as much as help the organization get better through high involvement from employees um, to, to get the fix made. Okay.
Okay. All right, Bob. This is this is your study. And yeah. So, and I'll in the spirit of time because I, I can already see we're we're running into it a little bit. Um, just at a high level, this was uh, related to some work that we done in uh, Indiana that. Um, we had had the success at Marshall. Uh, there was some need for some improvement in how we were handling warehouse um, logistics issues, particularly how we were having uh, more damage than we would want uh, it within those warehouses before things were being shipped. And so this was a case of actually a facility that was a high performing facility. It was actually one of the better ones in the Conagra Foods Network at the time. Um, the difference was is that the leaders there were very receptive to this because they had a, a belief that we know we're good, but we want to be great. And so when we went in there, one of the big things was, is how do you help them reduce some of their damage numbers, which didn't need to improve excessively, at least that's what we originally thought, without actually impacting productivity levels. And so this was a case uh, where we went in there, and, and I guess the, the, the most important takeaway from this, because you can read the slide if you're looking at it, was this is a case where we actually, as a communications person, I was dipping my hands into things that I felt that typically I would have no business dipping my hands into them. Uh, we looked immediately at their incentive plans and quickly found that they were actually incenting people on things that weren't necessarily driving behaviors to fix or to address damage issues, but more around productivity or even safety and quality. We saw that development plans were not necessarily driving the right type of, uh, you know, development of the right skills and things like that. We, we found that operations for how their communications worked from their overall group meetings to their kickoff meetings every morning and things like that were were dreadfully ineffect ineffective and were not necessarily communicating the right things to drive a different type of performance. We looked at analytics and metrics and really did a uh, saw that there was very low business acumen for the purposes of metrics were thrown around, but a number of the people who worked in that warehouse didn't know what they meant or thought they meant different things. So even how you define warehouse damage or how you define uh, basic safety uh, metrics and things like that was, was a deal. So from a communications perspective, yes, were we helping support how you know communication and information were, was being shared within that warehouse? You bet. Uh, but we're also spending a lot of time on fixing incentive plans uh, and on fixing you know, development plans uh, the, the entire communication system for which information flowed from top to bottom, how people, how smart people were about the business and the business acumen levels. We spent a lot of time there. And as you can see in the far right, um, within a pretty short period of time, Jim, I think it was what, roughly about three months? Yes. So we saw the, the types of improvements. In, and again, in a, a site that was tremendously successful and productive, they still saw a reduction in damage and cost by about 65%. And meanwhile, to Jim's point earlier, by virtue of seeing that, we actually saw productivity rise after about five or six months by, as it said, 16%. I think we also saw some improvement in safety and turnover as well, Jim, if memory serves. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. This is a, yeah, so this is a case of taking, you know, I was a communications guy by trade, right? I came in and I, you know, tried and true, public affairs, PR, employee comm, all that stuff. And it was taking those skills and, again, applying those skills to thinking again, or, or more broadly to thinking like a business person, as opposed to just, you know, let me write more stuff or let me, you know, design or, or create more cool video stuff. Uh, it was taking that next step professionally to really have an impact on the business. Yeah. I think the important takeaway from, from me anyway, here was you and I were all over that distribution center trying to find out what is causing this pack it, pack it, push it, uh, let the forklifts go ahead and do damage and pack it anyway and that sort of thing. And uh, Bob and I were scratching our head and, and both of us said at breakfast one day, said, There's, there is something causing this uh, kind of behavior. And I said, one of the things we haven't looked at is their incentives. And so Bob and I went in and talked to Carol, who was the head of the distribution center, and we said, ask her how the supervisors and the leaders got paid, what the incentive comp was. And she was the one who came back to us in about 15 minutes with a sheepish look on her face and said, I can't believe it. It's 80% productivity. Get it out the door. 10% safety, 10% quality. We're getting what we're paid for. Aren't we, Bob and Jim? And the, the answer was yes, absolutely. So don't just, um, this is, this is a, a really important lesson um, in that this isn't all about the newsletters and all the communication activities. Uh, it certainly wasn't about the scoreboard huddle, which was a, a very, very powerful um, uh, thing that they did there. It can be an incentive program who's communicating to behave this way, not this way. 
Right. And it's Jim, it's about redefining what communication really means, That's right? right. It, communication isn't about just getting things out or information sharing or other things like that, or even providing leadership counsel uh, in the communication space. It's also <laughs> things that normally would fall under HR or under operations or finance or other parts of the organization. And that was what was a big eye opener for me, especially at that point in my career. What gets rewarded gets done. Absolutely. Yep. yep. All righty. So Bob, Bob had these kinds of numbers. Um, just, just we're going to pause. We're going to pause right here. Right. Uh, yeah. Mary? Okay. You've got and, some questions. Yes. And we have 15 minutes. Left left. I know. Um, what were the tactical measures taken in the case we just discussed? The tactical measures were, um, I'll go back to a, a couple of things here um, that we did. If you look down the communication strategy, uh, we did some work in the area of uh, creating a strategic story um, with the leadership team because we wanted to make sure that there was a, a, balance, folk, a, a balance on productivity, safety, and quality. And so the strategic story, which um, uses the five information categories, content, context, vision, strategy, linkage, role, and support. So we created that story, and then we, uh, that story drove everything we did. And so we, the, the say needed to be reinforced by the do. And so we created a, a daily scoreboard huddle system. Uh, we did have a uh, continuous improvement process. We helped teach people about the importance of not having multiple touches when you're staging product that's on the uh, distribution center floor. The more times you touch it, the more times there are opportunities for something to go wrong. We improved recruiting and, and training and we got lots of high fives and recognition and people started really being excited about this, this goal of trying to um, reduce damage and costs and get, the, and get the productivity up. So there were a lot of very tactical things that we did it had to be. If we didn't, um, we wouldn't be uh, using all the tools that we had available to us. Okay, um, one last question. Uh -huh. How does this strategy translate into a non-manufacturing organization like healthcare or technology? Well, I've, I've done a great deal of work in healthcare and technology, and it, it translates the same way. You ask the same questions. Where are the best opportunities to improve performance? Um, and uh, one of the uh, pharmaceutical that I've been doing work with, it's not a manufacturing operation. It's, uh, it's trying to get um, pro product new ideas through the, um, uh, through the pipeline. Um, it's efficiency. It is um, just an awful lot of things. I've worked with uh, six different um, uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, trying to get the information through the pipeline and try to get uh, people in the organization, one one of the big uh, pharmas that I've worked with was having a struggle because it was too bureaucratic and it was couldn't get their own approvals done quickly enough. And so we identified an opportunity to help them streamline the whole process, the decision-making process. Um, any organization is going to have the same kinds of, potentially the same kinds of issues. That is something that's relevant to quality, service, cost, speed, whatever, uh, is going to uh, have the same kinds of problems. It just has a different flavor to to each one of them. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's not a. It, it's by no means a manufacturing uh, only. Um, I'm, I'm doing doing work right now with a, with an organization that is uh, looking to identify a sense of purpose for their organization, and it, it's not a manufacturing operation. It, it is a, uh, a very soft, uh, sort of touchy feely kind of a. Uh, Kind of an organization. Uh, Kristen Kelly was one of the one of the first people to. Um, he, she attended a workshop Roger Dupree and I conducted in New York. Went back to her um, headquarters in Toledo and she met with her CEO and said, "I can't believe the number of companies that I have just learned are doing this uh, more performance based communication versus activity based communication." And so um, he. Uh, ask her to get together with the head of, of uh, manufacturing. And uh, we went to Del Mar, New York, upstate New York, where they had uh, invested about a million dollars in technology and got nothing out of it. And uh, so we spent about five months there uh, working to improve the labor relations environment there, which was pitiful. Um, the head of the, the operation there in Del Mar, New York, would get up to speak in the large conference room and all the the uh, members of the union would turn around and face the wall and pick up their newspapers and read. 
and they had that kind of relationship with their the, between the plant manager and the, and some of the employees. So, it, within a, about a, a five six month period, we were able to get a nine percent productivity increase and savings. You can see the savings and the return on investment. It was a, a long process to get the labor folks on board, but once we did, we got an immense lift from it. Scott Fiedler, uh, after the, he was at FedEx, he's now at TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, he then um, went with me down to Houston where they had a lot of truck accidents and uh, we were able to do a, a fairly significant effort there to get accident down about 54%, uh, which was a huge uh, financial number. I, I don't recall the exact number right now, but he was talking about it about uh, last week. And it was a significant amount of money that, that that saved. Freight claims paid in the Memphis hub. He did that project on his own, and um, he was able to improve um, uh, freight claims paid by 25%. Courtney Reynolds' uh, Lubbock, Texas operation was trying to implement Lean Six Sigma and uh, was, was not very successful at it. So we went down there and worked with them in, at Lubbock and were able to get on-time delivery up 50%, which brought people back to customers back into the fold. And that enabled us to get about a 30% improvement in, uh, in sales. Uh, Dave, this is uh, uh, Dave Jackson who worked with Bob Kula. Uh, he is now with the University of Texas Macomb School, uh, but he was working in Rossville, uh, Illinois. Um, Bob and I were over there uh, with him uh, from time to time. And he got a 50% reduction in total incidents and a 50% reduction in rework. So these are these are people who are came, coming at it from different perspectives. Perspectives. Anna Roach was with Sarah Lee Earthgrains and uh, worked in a um, Chicago bakery. And this was in like 18 or 20 days, we, we were able to get an 18% yield improvement. Yield is if you're baking a cake and you're walking across your kitchen floor and you've got flour in a, in a, in a measuring cup and you accidentally drop some of it on the floor, you can't pick it up and put it back because it's, it's, it's not good for you. Um, so you have to go back and get more flour. That, that is when you, when you don't have to go back and get more flour, that improves the yield. So you get more for your investment. So the um, I want Bob to talk about this. This is a, a lot of people say, and you, you saw it up front, is that I just got so much on my plate, and that came out of the Populo study. I've got so much on my plate, I don't know where to start. Um, I uh, stole, when I was with Towers Perrin, a, an assessment that was being used by the human resource consulting practice when I was leading the change management consulting practice. So I stole this, what's called a value to cost assessment. And um, basically it looks at three dimensions, how important an activity is to improving how people do their jobs, two, um, how well it's performing, and three, what's the cost? Bob, you want to explain how you did this at uh, Conagra Foods or at uh, Kiwit? Yeah, so the, the um, uh, kind of high level version of this is that at uh, Conagra Foods, the entire team actually went through this exercise to do a value to cost analysis. And we actually got leadership on board so that it really gave us an opportunity um, with their support and buy in to say, hey, look, let us identify the key communication tools or tactics or things like that that the organization either believes are ineffective or, or, or just simply not important so that we can focus our attention on the things that are effective and important or uh, at least get the things that may not be effective but are considered important, get those up into one of those higher quadrants as you can see on the slide. And doing that at Conagra, being part of the entire team, it really did help the team identify uh, some communication tools that we thought were still important that the organization simply didn't. So we were able to get rid of those and, and we had leadership buy and support that if we hadn't done an exercise like this and had just gone in and said, hey, you know, we're gonna stop doing this because that'll save some money here or whatever, but without any sort of rationale or data to support it, it would have been an issue. And here at QIT, um, as we support um, what we call our operating districts where uh, our, our core groups uh, regionally or geographically or they're, they're in certain locations, uh, where we have con um, construction folks and, and engineering people. Uh, when we have new leaders come on board, a number of them actually look at how communication is happening, and we use this tool as a way to survey all the folks in the district as these new leaders are coming on board to identify ways that we can improve communication and help us understand what we can stop doing and perhaps uh, improve, and then also things that we maybe should start doing. 
So it's been a real powerful tool and there's really no rocket science to it. It's not, I mean, if somebody like me can figure it out, um, it's not too difficult. Um, but it's a very easy way to do it. And, and Jim, I, I know you provide your contact information after this, but uh, Jim has some great templates and tools to show previous surveys and, and just how simple it is. Yeah, well, one, of, one of the things that is um, very nice about this is that the CEOs and your higher more senior uh, leaders really understand this because this to them is portfolio management. Um, when I was talking with the uh, chairman of, uh, of uh, General Motors, Rick Wagner, with Corby Kassler, his communication person at the time, we were sitting and talking about the value cost assessment. He says, oh, this is just portfolio management. I like this. I think this makes a lot of sense. Gary Rodkin, who was CEO of ConAgra Foods when Bob was there, did exactly the same thing. He called it his little four box thingy. And he said, I really like this. This makes a lot of sense. So what you're going to find is, is if, you're, if you want to get stuff off your plate or you want to get higher value stuff onto your plate, this kind of an assessment will help, um, help you immensely. Okay, here are some other communication clients that we've, we've worked with. Uh, consumer, for the person who asked about, is this manufacturing only? It, 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 we have done a lot of work in manufacturing. We have done work with FedEx. And then there's consumer goods uh, organizations uh, like food products and things like that. High-tech high uh, engineering um, companies like Honeywell. Uh, diversified technology, and uh, you heard about the distribution and logistics, and, and there are uh, other industries. There's, there's no industry that just mean, is immune from this. There are, when there are people doing things in the organization, there are always communication opportunities that will help improve the organization. So well, the key thing that we're, I think our, our, our point is, is as we measure, measure what matters, what matters to the health of the business. Uh, yes, it's important to have a process measure like the tweets and that sort of thing, but don't stop there because a tweet number of tweets you have doesn't tell you whether you had a good return on investment or not. Okay. Um, I'm going to be giving this presentation, uh, not this one we did today, but a similar presentation, how to boost the role and image of communication professionals at the IABC Heritage Conference um, that is going to be in Richmond. And Amy and Mary, who you've heard from today, are uh, the key players uh, with the uh, IABC Heritage Conference, I believe president and vice president. Um, and so they, they're going to be down there, and they, they're going down there very soon to start building things. But I'm going to be doing an almost a three-hour session, I know, which is, uh, gives us a little bit more time to talk about the details of some of the things that we've covered here in an hour. And so um, I, I look forward to you, and I, I welcome your, your coming to the IEBC uh, Richmond uh, Conference. Uh, if you want to sign up for my leadership report, it's a very popular um, uh, report that comes out every couple of weeks. And, and it's basically, it's dealing with these kinds of issues, all kinds of communication issues, leadership issues, reward system issues, HR issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here is um, some uh, workshops uh, that we conduct. We got to get a little promo in for those workshops there. And then finally, suggested reading list. A lot of people on these kinds of calls and just, um, you know, when I bump into people at various conferences, say, well, what do I need to read to be able to know more about these kinds of issues? And so I put together a, a list of things that, that fall into five categories. You can see them there, foundational work strategy, leadership, people, communication, transformational change in specific concepts and disciplines. And as each one of the pages that follow here have a number of different things that I would suggest you read. If you've got any questions about any of this, like of these two, which one would you read first? Call me or email me. I'll be glad to talk. Uh, as Bob knows, I get a lot of calls from communication people who are looking for help to move in this direction. And, and sometimes sometimes just you know, giving a chat with me, I'll be glad to, glad to help. Thank you very much for being on this. We are at two o'clock. Bob, thank you very much for joining me on this. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, I'd like to thank both of you on behalf of IABC. Um, I think we could have talked all afternoon and probably well into tomorrow. Um, <laughs> this was a wonderful topic, a wonderful um, presentation, um, very useful, um, and we really appreciate it. Um, now, everyone else, you are invited to our next IABC Heritage Region webinar, which focuses on what is the digital workplace and why should you care? 
It takes place at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, October 24th, and you will be receiving um, emails about this. Um, other than that, if there are any questions that anyone else has, um, Jim, we've gotten some nice compliments in the chat box. Um, you did a great job today, um, you and Bob, and people are appreciating that. Um, you know, I appreciate everyone attending. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, if there are any questions, you can send me an email at heritage hyphen region at iabcheritage.com and I will pass the questions on to Jim and Bob um, for um, an individual answer. Yeah, absolutely. Please do this. This is uh, really important to us too to be able to respond to the questions. Every time, this is our fifth uh, session uh, webinar and uh, after every one we got a lot of questions and uh, I will certainly pass them on to Bob if it's a Bob question and certainly will answer all of the ones that you send to me. Um, so please do that. I, I want all of you to be very, very successful with this kind of an approach. Thank you. And Amy has posted the, um, the email address to use if you have questions. So thank you again for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon.